Okay, excellent. Then, um, without any further ado, let me uh, welcome you to this um, animal genomic special interest group that we are launching today. Uh, many of you are familiar with this channel because it all started uh, uh, under the Bovreg banner and uh, the, the Eurofunk as a Eurofunk special interest group on, on pipelines. Uh, at the end of Eurofunk, of uh, Bovreg, we decided to broaden a little bit the, the channel and to make it uh, a bit more inclusive beyond Eurofunk. And uh, lucky enough, NFCore, thanks to Phil, Hugh Wells, and, uh, and Sven Nansek, we were able to, uh, to have the support of NFCore to launch a special interest group. And that is what we are doing today. So uh, uh, this new channel is really meant to support anyone doing animal genomics and using NFCore or NextFlow pipelines. Uh, 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 it's entirely self-managed, so that means all of us are entirely free to propose new topics, to organize this thing as we see fit, to best serve our community. And uh, to put it very simply, but Phil will uh, give a bit more details later, but to put it very simply, this channel is typically the kind of place where you would come and say, I am doing this kind of analysis. Is there anyone doing the same type of analysis? Which kind of tools are you using? Which kind of pipelines? And there we will have a small community using the Slack channel, hopefully exchanging about tricks and trying to maximize harmonization in the kind of analysis we do. Now, uh, uh, we hope to have uh, recurring features, especially on tool discussion and this kind of things. The most recurring feature will be a monthly seminar. It will uh, range from uh, uh, at-hand topics, you know, anybody among our community wanting to discuss some aspect of genomics. We also have to have, uh, hope to have uh, forward-looking talks like the one of Krista today, and uh, uh, starting from the fall, a series of talks about uh, state of the art in human genomics, because human genomics is often a driver of what is going to happen in animal genomics. And in general, any of the topics you guys will find of interest for this crowd. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, Krista Kuhn, who is our, our, our first speaker. Now, Krista was uh, just appointed as president of the Friedrich Loeffler Institute. So that's something that happened just at the end of Bovreg. And I think it's a very, very nice development. And Krista is uh, well known to many of you for her work in animal genetics. She's been uh, highly involved in, uh, in, 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 in QTL analysis uh, in Cal and uh, has been uh, a, a, a member of the International uh, Society on Animal Genetics since 1990. She's also an editor for the scientific journal Animal since 2006, associate editor for genetic selection and evolution uh, or genetics and breeding. So she's someone very, very well known in the field. And I am sure that her talk on the future of uh, genomics for farmed animal will be of interest to all of you. And without further ado, Krista, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cedric. Um, can I share my screen? I think so, Jose. Jose is the host, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, current presentation mode. Uh, let's see what I can. Perfect, Chris. Uh, it's, uh, it's not in presentation. Yeah, uh, almost. One yeah, more time. Is it, is it presentation mode now for you? No, 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 no. Which one is it? Um, it's the one where we see the slides, you know, the, 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 the one where you work on your slides. Better now? Exactly. Yes. Now it's great. No. Now it's perfect. Okay. Because for me, it's, it's the opposite way around, but okay, I'm, I'm working with three. Yes, screens. that should be. If you're on a Mac, that's exactly the confusing okay. thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Cedric, for the invitation. And actually, I feel a little bit, or well, embarrassed, a little bit shy because all the competence in the field of NFCore and bioinformatics is on your side. And I'm really, really, well, only a, a sideliner in this field. Uh, thank you for introducing me, but I, I really don't feel that I can expert, but uh, you asked me to give a presentation on maybe some future aspects of animal genomics. And 
I suggested to go even a little bit beyond and maybe I can give some or one or two ideas about what might be needed uh, in the upcoming future. Um, so let me first give a, a brief overview of what you can expect. So I'll very briefly, uh, you mentioned Freddie Glover Institute, I uh, very briefly introduced where I work. Uh, then I go to what, what's Bovrek and Fang, although I see from the audience that most of you already know about it. I wasn't fully sure about the audience, so I thought put in some slides on this. Um, then generally uh, how I think the idea of workflow managers, Nextflow and NF Core um, has taken over in, in the, our field. And then the, the core will be a future expectations for and from NF Core, and then maybe also challenges for the animal genomics group and beyond. Uh, so let's briefly start. Uh, if you go in, into the center of this little island, this is where I'm working. At the moment, it's the world's uh, oldest virus research institute. And uh, in the very far east, northeastern corner of, of Germany, and to give you a background why I might be interested also in the future about NF Core, we are an independent federal authority, so directly under the Ministry of, uh, uh, of um, Agriculture and Nutrition, but mainly we are working on animal diseases, animal welfare, animal husbandry, animal nutrition, and farm animal genetics. And these are all the fields where I think animal genomics will have an impact in, in the future. And this is also because some of the ideas I got from my colleagues who are working on viruses, on animal science, including farm uh, animal genetics, animal welfare, husbandry, and animal nutrition, where I think a lot of the future demands will probably come from in interdisciplinary projects. One special feature we have, which, which is rather unique, we are one of only four institutes worldwide who can work with BSL-4 pathogens that's up to things like Ebola, uh, or Crimean Congo virus. Um, so um, we are really a very high security laboratory, not only in terms of IT, but also in terms of other bi biological viruses. As Cedric mentioned, things started with BOVREC. BOVREC is a Horizon 2020 funded consortium as a <laughs> contribution to the Global FAN. And one of the objectives was to establish new laboratory and bioinformatics tools because we wanted to annotate the functional genomic elements in the genome, particularly those that are highly relevant uh, to... There's some background noise. Is this is somebody, somebody speaking up? Because at least in my speaker, it comes up. Every, everybody is muted, yeah? except uh, you and I right now. Okay, so okay. I'm, I'm not sure where the noise comes from. Okay, I, I go ahead then. Um, so we wanted to annotate the functionally active regions in the genome, uh, which are relevant to modulate the plasticity and variability of the farmed animal genomes. So it's about the annotation. So it's a lot of basic research, but also then to channel this uh, knowledge to develop prototype models to integrate biological um, knowledge about the regulatory variation uh, in genomic prediction schemes. That's the, already the application side of this basic knowledge. And also we wanted to provide training and dissemination of these tools. So um, Cedric knows that right from the beginning, we thought, how can we best um, tailor our data analysis that it fulfills our needs because we have the challenge that we had many different layers uh, in the functional annotation, including the transcriptome, chromatin excess. We want to map regulatory regions, go for the methylome, epigenetic response, the EQTLs, and many, many different layers for many uh, samples, even on top of each other. So this definitely required a lot of standardized reproducible um, pipelines, which in the end can then also be um, further exploited and used, for example, for biology informed genomic prediction for the real applicants, the ones our, who are our, st our stakeholders. You know, animal genetics is not about 
Now, genomics is mostly about animal breeding and maybe animal husbandry, which uh, people who are not really knowledgeable about the main shape of the genome and maybe not even interested in the gene function, genome function itself. So that this was the, the driver was how can we best develop pipelines? And um, it was quite obvious in the beginning, we had three different projects, cluster projects. Bovrag was one of them uh, dedicated to farmed, to the cattle, whereas we had gene switch on the monogastrics like pigs and uh, pig, uh, poultry. And we also had the fish community there with aqua farm. And they, I think, we all faced with similar um, challenges because in the end, once the DNA is there and the assays are there, the data analysis uh, shares many, many similarities across species. And this, I think, was also one of the things which persuaded the projects in the more recently funded period of Horizon 2020 in Europe, Polo Ruminant, Ronimo and Rumidon, to join this because um, the bioinformatics group, I think, was maybe besides the ones on genomic prediction, uh, the one, the group which shared most common interests and also most comparatively and interactively collaborated. Why was this concept of workflow managers so interesting? I think the, the main things also for future application is that it's reproducible. Containers and workflow managers in general, they enable that data analysis can be scaled. So we have one sample, one data set, but you also can have hundreds. And on the other hand, it's reproducible so that people can, in the end, reproduce the deposited data sets and then on top of those continue with their analyses. And the other element is, I think it's also quite general that it works with containers, which contain all the necessary elements. And when you have many, many different, I think I don't have to tell this to most of you, but people outside often struggle that the main work in Pipeline analysis is converting one structure, one data format into the other one. Uh, and streamlining, streamlining this has a huge advantage uh, because it saves time for the subsequent um, steps which, you, which we wanted to conduct. I felt that NextFlow and NFCore made quite a development during, from the start when I think we didn't even have this DSL2 module, module option. I think in the start, the focus was mostly on the developer side, but now I just, I, I, I brought this from, from your website, and of course you put into, into a view also facilities and, and, and users. And I think for my talk for the next minutes today, I would like to focus on these end users. I don't feel myself as a developer, and I can't speak for facilities, but I think this move forward for users is, I think, is a major leap and will probably, at least from my perspective as a non-bioinformatician, one of the, will be one of one of the major impacts that NFCore and NextFlow will have. So in the meantime, you have many, many pipelines developed already for users to, to take over. So what are then the expect, expectations for and from NFCore? Um, you probably might have had a look into this FANG 2.0 paper, which we published uh, several years ago, which a little bit depicts the future of animal genomics in the, I think, in the short term. So that's the major things which will happen, which will need data analysis. This is definitely the FANG GTEx project, which integrates um, the different um, expression EQTL analysis with um, information on functional annotation uh, and also information about uh, features within cell types and tissues. Um, we will also see large phenotype collections, so many data from many animals um, that are tested uh, in well-described environments. And this is, I think, also a change a little bit to what the core animal genomics work is about, where we mostly deal with very few animals. Now, 
we've seen extension to a large animal phenotypes. In vitro biorepositories in the field of more and more concern and more and more public concern about uh, how we conduct animal research. So in vitro research will definitely be a major uh, challenge for the uh, scientists working on wet lab experiments in the future. We will have the idea that not all cells are the same. So the single cell atlases and all the, the uh, technological developments we have, this is a very, very dynamic and fastly emerging field. This also will then uh, contribute challenges. We will have high throughput genotype, high throughput in vitro systems trying to evaluate potential genomic variants with um, potential which potential impact might be associated. And last but not least, the pan genomes and the comparative genomics. So I think this paper really depicts depicted the, from my perspective, more immediate um, challenges or perspectives of uh, animal genomics. And I would like to spend a few minutes on what I think might be the ones beyond this initiative which is to some extent or a major extent um, brought forward and also pushed into the future by the Eurofund initiative, the research infrastructure project, but also the FANG 2.0 initiative uh, on the global scale. So from my point of view, um, we will face several um, movements into the future. The first is that for in the past, we also based most of the analysis starting from, a, from one reference genome per species. So the first one, then UMD3, ARS 1.3, and now ARS 2.0. So it, it, it's and the, the frequency of the change in the reference assembly, I think, is more and more speeding up. And at the moment, Bobrek, you know, Daniel Fisher, uh, we discussed, shouldn't we redo everything now with the most recent ARS 2.0 compared to the ARS 1.3, which we used for all our BOVREC work. So redoing all the analysis we did, which uh, comprises hundreds and hundreds of data sets, uh, will be definitely something which um, will require a huge workload. But I think the real challenge comes from the pan genomes. So we will face that in the past we had this one, reference genome, but we will see that we have a dynamic pool of pan genomes. Uh, I, today I looked into the uh, an NCBI and at the moment we have 27 uh, cattle genomes, for example, deposited. And we saw that, um, for example, this nice paper from Hubert Paus group from the ATH demonstrating how nicely pan genomes can contribute to um, the phenotype mapping in, in our species. And so we will probably go into the era of a dynamic pool of pan genomes, which have to, which has then to be um, included in the subsequent steps of data analysis. Then we have the question, currently we took always for granted that we have one genome per individual. I think this is really, um, well, something we, we took for granted. However, for example, immunologists, they already well know, uh, quite know well, that for example, immune cells, they don't have a single genome, they, they change. And there's some fluidics also with response to uh, endogenous retroviruses, which then create ch ch changes in the, in the genome between the different cell populations. And finally, we definitely will see that there is no such thing like junk in genomes, which altogether creates an increasing complexity as a starting point for analysis. So this is all something which I think we will create a lot of work for the future of animal genomics per se. But I think we will see more and more the demand to go beyond. To, many, many people will use our genomic technologies and our knowledge uh, in other disciplines. And we have to work interdisciplinary because the increasing demand comes from people who have not that much knowledge about animal genomics but need the information. This is, a, for example, in the field of physiology. Increasingly, 10 years ago, there was almost no paper with any aspect of, or let's say 15 years ago, 
no paper, at least in veterinary or in animal science physiology, with a lot of genome work. Now, transcriptomics, epigenomics is a commonplace feature in, in all physiological work. We see that veterinary medicine moves into the field of, of animal genomics. I'll come to this in a minute. And also all the people who work on biodiversity, we who in the past um, many times worked on more of the structural or phenotypic features, they all need easy to use approved pipelines. They can't spend months and years to develop pipelines to get themselves uh, knowledgeable to how to integrate all the different things spend a lot of wasted time, these experts um, for pipeline um, establishment. They, they want to do the, the, the go to data analysis per se, but they need easy to use uh, proof pipelines. For this, they need reasonable parameters and options. So which different uh, parts of pipelines would be reasonable um, to, to um, glue together? They need a basic characterization of the deposited data sets to pave the way for future application. And as I said, this will need uh, modularization. And that's why I was really very, very much amazed by this development to have this DSL2 modularizing option. I think this is a major leap towards um, application beyond the core genomics um, data analysis, because it will probably enable to to achieve progress to integrate multidisciplinary approaches, which I think uh, bring the real information from the data sets we um, put together. Then there's some, as some aspects where I think also the NEXCO and NF4 community can have a sub substantial impact and create benefits beyond the scientific community. Or the, the, let's say the, the basics basic science scientific community. On the one hand, we have the industry interests, for example, in the field of biology informed breeding, but we also have governmental or public interests, for example, when it comes to uh, the indigenous resources and uh, obeying Nagoya rules. So where, for example, governments, they don't want to share um, sequence data or industry, they don't want to share genotypes. And this next flow, and of course, philosophy of also modularizing and sharing paths between partners would also enable to be uh, to have embargoed of private data sets to be integrated into common data analysis. And I think this is something which should not be underestimated. It will make uh, available data sets probably, which at the moment at least will be very, be very difficult to include into uh, large network projects. And for the perspective of breeding, um, once genomic enabled breeding is really put into practice, the breeding organizations or the breeding, the evaluating, evaluating centers, they need standardized versioning to create reproducible data. For example, when one of the uh, components of a pipeline is changed, they can't frequently follow up a change again and again and again of their um, evaluation pipelines. They need standardized reproducible um, core pipelines to integrate biological knowledge into their um, evaluation routines. Because for example, they also do some rechecks um, to go, go with confirmation populations. And if the um, initial steps frequently would change, this would create a major problem for them. Uh, one new, new feature in my, I apologize for this, in my new field um, of veterinary diagnostics, I, I learned that there is a very strong need for standardized diagnostic pipelines. There's a lot of accreditation and reference handbooks, which sometimes even at EU level have legal binding procedures how to do some of the diagnostics. And for this, for example, sequencing of to identify virus strains, phylogeny analysis, or uh, antimicrobial resistance genes, I just have brought here a um, very recent um, picture uh, from uh, the highly 
pathogenic avian influenza, uh, which currently is some quite popular or unpopular in the US because it also concerns dairy cattle. Their speed is essential. You, you can't put together pipelines and it takes three weeks, four weeks, 10 weeks. Uh, and on the other hand, it has to be reproducible and easily and fastly reproducible. And um, workflow managers established pipelines would fully uh, fulfill these needs. They could be standardized, uh, they would be in place easily and would be reproducible worldwide. So speed and reproducibility would be things which are very essential to these um, uh, application. And I think this is something which the animal genomics community together with the veterinarians can um, achieve. And as I said, as I already said, this need this modularization the process of integrating these multidisciplinary approaches. To some extent, however, you might also think, how does this fit uh, with commercial alternatives? Because, I, for example, in the field of veterinary diagnostics, but also in many other fields, you know that more and more, once things become popular, then also commercial enterprises enter the scheme. And you might discuss between yourselves, how do you do you find yourself placed in, in this uh, intersection? And finally, one of the challenges I would like to bring up for the animal genomics and of core community, which is on the one hand, you want to pr make progress and it's a very dynamically evolving field. On the other hand, you also want to keep reproducibility and standardization. How long do you want to keep, for example, next for versioning? How easy would you like to do this? Would you like to make it? How long would you want to keep these um, versions uh, alive? That's probably something which needs to be discussed. Then the definition, who do you see as your main customer or your key interest groups? You already brought this on the website, these three different layers, the developer, the user, and the facility. So what is the, the main customer, the applicant or the developer? So what we, would be your main future um, driving force? It's also maybe for this new NFCore animal genomics group. Then the, the question, how do you include new technologies that comes to artificial intelligence or uh, when there are key commercial products, how do we place ourselves in, in this area? And then something which maybe some of you already encounter, there's always the concern about IT safety, at least in my institution, maybe because it's very governmentally close. Uh, the IT core IT frequently complains about containers and use of containers. Then one thing which is more on the applicant side is on the one hand, we want to make the application as easy as possible. On the other hand, we have also to be a little bit concerned about unreasonable analysis or unreasonable application of pipelines. The more easy you make it, the more public it can become, even to people who probably are not well aware what they are really doing. And finally, I think, as it needs a discussion about the level of data analysis up to which the NFCore community will go. Uh, I think we already discussed this to some extent, for example, there was this, in Bovrek, we had an initial discussion about the RNA-seq pipeline, and you see now that more and more and more and more and more evolved into subsequent applications. But to some extent, um, we also had the discussion that uh, Cedric and his group said, okay, we would like to stop here at some point because it becomes too diverse. It cannot be put into this standardized reproducible workflow manager system. We have to make a cut from where then people have to move into all the different directions which are possible. That's probably something which needs a discussion within the group to what extent of data analysis uh, the end of core community or the, at least the animal genomics community would like to go. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you again for the great NextFlow and Encore and of course impact uh, that was made to the Bobrack project. I think it was really a major impact that you made to our project. And uh, I was very glad to have Frederick and his team uh, in the project right from the beginning, because I think 
we really distributed the knowledge, not just within the EU, but also beyond and can create really a legacy to the community from our uh, Horizon 2020 projects. For that, I'd like also like to thank my partners in the Bobrek project for their frequent discussions, input into all the ideas uh, we developed uh, in Bobrek. And I think with this, I spent a little bit more than 20 minutes, but I hope, Cedric, that maybe I could give some some ideas, even though I really, as I mentioned in the beginning, I feel a little bit embarrassed about all the competences in bioinformatics. Thank you so much, Krista. I could not hope for a better introduction and a better launching for this uh, for, for, for this channel. And uh, as you have seen on the program, we now are going to have a, a round table. And uh, we did put some topics, but uh, your last slide uh, contains a lot of food for thoughts and, and, and we are going to bounce on this. So this is really nice. Before moving to the next step, uh, let's see if we have some questions from Krista. I'm trying to have a look at everybody. It's not always easy for me to see. Do not hesitate to unmute yourself if you want to ask something to Krista. I have a better view. Uh, while, while, while people are gathering their thoughts, I, I had maybe... Uh, 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 Marvin, you were raising your hand? No? Okay. Uh, so I had uh, I had one uh, one important question to me. So as you know, one of the big things that is happening in uh, in genomics now is the Earth's biogenome. One point five million species are going to be sequenced, and uh, 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 one of the most uh, striking and dramatic results I have seen these last years was the uh, primate pan genome. You know how much medical knowledge can be unlocked by sequencing our 150 relatives. As you know, the primate genome is just a, a relative, not naive, but a relatively simple use of this data is as precise in the recapitulation as patho pathogenic mutations as the state-of-the-art methods we had centered on human. Now, have you started thinking of how the sister species are going to become useful to, 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 to project like ours in animal genomics? I I think uh, we already see this. We already see this. I, I mentioned this paper from Hubert Powers group already. Uh, and um, also there's a recent one, another one from, from this group uh, indicating uh, when they look at the Vizent genome uh, coming up with missing, some missing pathways. So uh, I, one of the things which definitely need a lot of attention, from my perspective, would need further attention is the entire chapter of ruminants. So what 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 makes ruminant, maybe it's my personal interest, but what really makes the, the ruminant uh, different in, in many aspects? And I think ruminants uh, will be also key for um, sustainable systems agriculture, because they can make use of things that we humans cannot eat. And will be a, will have a major impact, I think, on future um, food supply. So I think, um, and we already made quite a lot of progress in sequencing of those genomes. So I, I I'm quite confident that um, this will help. Another aspect which I would be interesting interested in, I think, for for hundreds of years we had mouse as mouse models as models for humans, and we will probably all agree. That the mouse is probably not not a really a good appropriate model for for human, uh, and my my expectation is that once we know more about the genomes of other species, we might come up with much better models for specific aspects. So um, it's probably not one fits all, but um, as we know from, for example, um, ophthalmologists, they know that. Cattle eyes are a very suitable model, pathological, surgical model for, for the human eye. And in terms of genomics, uh, my hope is that we will come to see that for spe specific aspects of human medicine, of human physiology, we will see much better suited animal models in our large fundus of, of species. That's, that's the other side uh, beyond then um, agriculture. 
Yeah, I, 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 I actually could not agree more. And it's, it's, it's increasingly clear that uh, the data being gathered in all of these species and itself to be, to be used for, for human medical purposes. Do we have any other question for, uh, for Krista? Uh, actually, if not yet, uh, I have one, one, one more question actually. So historically, uh, uh, the animal genomics has tended to follow human genomics, like uh, uh, in some way, both reg and, and, and all of our projects can be described as a kind of encode for farmed animal, right? And then following on that lead, you now have GTEx, you know, for, for, for farmed animal, GTEx for cow, and so on. So do you think this trend will keep going? That is to say that the, 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 the state of the art, the frontiers in, in human genomics will make their way into animal genomics? Or do you think that animal genomics is gathering its own momentum and that it may go in direction that are specific to this field, that may you know, inspire human genomics, in fact, the other way around. Yeah. To and some so extent, what? Yeah. To some extent, we will always follow because the, the big money and the, the, the big money and also that it's, it's for technology development and so on. And this will definitely be always be in, in human medicine. So that's that's not no question about it. Many, many technology developments will come further for humans. One field actually where I think that could go the other way around, or at least some inspiration, is epigenomics. Because uh, compared to, to humans, we have a chance to have really sp specified environments, to keep animals in specified environments and really then come up with better and more precise um, data about the consequences of the environment, because we can keep it so constant, which you can't in, in, in human. For example, we can really... Uh -huh. We can starting from from who is mated to whom, uh, how how pregnancies are um, followed, uh, how the the neonates uh, are treated uh, are fed. This is all something which we can monitor very closely, or even determine or give them in specific environments. So I think there the animal genomics community in the field of epigenomics, at least we can provide more reliable data then uh, then can, can come from the human field. I see. I, I, we have a question from Silva, but for just finishing on my question. So then my impression has always been that uh, human genetics was a little bit boring because mostly descriptive. And, and if it was down to human, we would have strong suspicions genetics were, but we will not be entirely sure. While when it comes to farmed animals, we know it works because that's how we've been feeding the population over over the last millennium. You know, improving the genetic, using genetics to improve the breeds, and so we have a proof of principle. Now, do you think I've, I'm always surprised to see how segregated human genetics and animal genetics tend to be? Do you think that this genomics development will bring these two communities a little bit closer together? Actually, they are. We, are, we see a lot of animal genetics uh, in the human field. They, they try to hide it a little bit. For example, they uh, uh, you just have to go to Rosslyn where they even uh, share, share one, one position in, in, in human and, and animal genomics. So actually, I think we did a lot of fertilization of the human genetics field from, from our side. Maybe those people don't put this in the forefront now, and they don't um, talk about breeding values, but they talk about genetic predisposition to get a, a disease. But uh, I think they are, they are already, at least in, in the field of, maybe in the field of quantitative genetics, it's more than in molecular genetics, but in the field of quantitative genetics, they are very close. Sorry, Silva, you had a question. I'm sure it was, it was um, to come back to your question, it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, I agree if that is what you were thinking, Cedric, that uh, uh, experimental genetics is easier to perform on animals than on humans, uh, obviously. And in, in, that, in that topic, I mean, for instance, maybe uh, developmental genetics is also something that is 
for which uh, the animal models have something to play and and could be useful to help the well as you know historically uh, yeah development has been uh, studied a lot on uh, animal models and maybe also for everything that is related to evolution and uh, uh, this kind of studies where we have like a broad spectrum of animals um, and species uh, there's something that could be useful for the for the scientific community in particular that is a bit beyond the you know the human only uh, scope yeah i mean we were we could afford by domesticate by domesticating animals to create a huge diversity so it's, for example if you go to dogs we, you have dogs with one kilogram you have dogs with 80 kilogram imagine a slim female of let's say 40 kilograms, a very slim female human with 40 kilograms, multiply this by 80, and then you would end up, <laughs> you can't imagine this. So this is an example how, how diverse we created, uh, how much diversity we created by domestication within one species. It's, it's in incredible. Um, do we have any other questions for Krista? So if not, we, we, we thank her again for this very, very nice and inspiring talk. Thanks a lot, Krista. And uh, I'll just, I, I look for the emoji for, uh, there, there is an emoji for this, which I never find, ah, yeah, reaction. 